Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Meaning of the Minds webinar. Thank you for joining. Um, today's webinar is on leveraging cell phones and citizens to transform public transport with lessons from Nairobi. My name is Jesse Fowler Hahn. I'm the Executive Director of Meaning of the Minds. As many of you know, since um, we've had many of you on our webinars over the past five years. Um, we're a global thought leadership network and platform with year-round digital and in-person programming. We connect global urban sustainability, innovation, and technology leaders across sectors to share best practices, tools, and solutions through our blog, meetingofthemind.org, our monthly webinar series, our pop-up events, workshops, meetups, and conferences. Our 11th Annual Fall Leadership Summit convenes from October 23 to 25 in Cleveland, Ohio, here in the United States, where we will be continuing the conversation from today's webinar. Registration is open at meetingofthemind.org if you are interested in joining us there. Without further ado, I'll introduce our two presenters today. Jackie Klopp is Associate Research Scholar at the Center for Sustainable Urban Development at Columbia University in New York. This center is a VREF Center of Excellence. VREF is one of our partners. She's also a co-founder of the Digital Matatus. Um, Henry Chang is the CEO of the Kenyan Alliance of Resident Associations, also known as CARA the apex body representing the voice and proactive action of resident associations on access to public service delivery and taxpayers' rights in Kenya. So Jackie and Henry are both joining us um, from Kenya today, and we're very excited you're here with us. And over to you, Henry. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, it's nice to be here with everyone. So like you've heard, Jackie and I are going to take this presentation, and uh, the agenda of our presentation is as follows. First of all, I'm going to look at the context around the public transport debate and struggles in Nairobi, and then we are going to take you through a bottom-up bottom -up approach to reform through citizen engagement. We're also going to talk briefly about experiments leveraging cell phones for active reform efforts. And in this particular uh, bullet, we are going to give you two examples, which one of them being uh, a phone-based survey on transportation that we carried out. We are also going to talk about uh, creating public information about uh, public transport in Nairobi, uh, which consists of uh, mini buses, we call them Matatu here, uh, the Digital Matatus Project, and Matri Route Example. And then uh, we are going to conclude by lessons, doing lessons on how to use cell phones and citizens to work on improving public transport in Africa City. So that's going to be the, 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 the model of our presentation. And uh, very quickly, just to kick us off, I'm going to start the presentation, and then uh, Jackie will take us through the next part of it. So just to give us the context about uh, Nairobi for, uh, for, for, uh, for a start, uh, in many African countries, uh, African continent, rely heavily on public transport. Uh, but there's been uh, very few African case studies that exist around using creative strategies to encourage bottom-up reforms. Uh, most of the transportation planning uh, is, is technocratic and top-down and project-driven, not citizen giving input or even knowing what is happening and the, and the results are, and are often disappointed. So coming to Nairobi, which is the point of our focus today, I just want to give you a little bit of a context about uh, Nairobi in regards to transportation. Uh, first of all, this is a city uh, of uh, about 4 million people uh, residing in, in Nairobi. And uh, the city heavily relies on uh, public transport through what we call matatus. These are basically mini buses which transport uh, people from one point to another. We also have other modes of transport and motor transport and even commuter rail, but uh, these are used to a lesser extent. Uh, what uh, is uh, ironical is that uh, despite the fact that uh, most uh, residents in Nairobi, actually 70% of them, rely on public transport for movement from one point to another, this uh, mode of transport is uh, generally neglected in the sense that uh, investment prioritization is not uh, directed to public transport as, as expected. Uh, and uh, this has contributed uh, led to a number of challenges which contribute to poor, poor, poor public transport system. And uh, one of the reasons why uh, the city uh, have uh, 
a public transport system that uh, we will not be very proud of is because uh, one, we have uh, this jointed institutional framework that look at issue about uh, public transport. And uh, by this, if you could go to a little bit more detail, is that we have a number of institutions that are supposed to look at, look at issue of public tra transport, but then uh, the level of coordination uh, then impedes their work because uh, uh, that they don't seem to speak to each other in terms of what needs to be done. We also look at the aspect of poor infrastructure uh, within the city, which then uh, affects uh, uh, the issue on uh, public transport. There's also a culture of uh, general disregard of existing laws where enforcement of the laws is, uh, is poor and uh, in most cases, particularly in the public transport sector, we find that uh, the people disregard even the basic traffic laws, they disregard uh, the laws that are existing and this uh, has a negative impact. And uh, I dare add that we also have lack of political goodwill because uh, there are a number of ideas, a number of uh, issues that have been brought up in terms of how to address uh, the public transport system. But the people who are supposed to implement this idea don't seem to be pushing enough or having a keen interest to ensure that uh, the idea sees the light of the day. So all these are combining to uh, contribute to the aspect of uh, poor public transport system uh, in Nairobi. Uh, improving the transport system in Nairobi and making the streets walkable should be key priority, but this is not the case. And uh, Nairobi being a transit dominant city, uh, still, uh, there's still quite a lot of uh, uh, areas to be addressed in terms of uh, transportation focus. Uh, if you look at uh, what we have uh, on, on the slide, the Tika Superhighway, for instance, uh, uh, which, was, which was done uh, without planning for bus service or even NMT facilities. This is one area that demonstrates what happens when we have a, a, a project that doesn't uh, address the issue of uh, bottom-up approach. And by that I mean involving the public, or pu uh, public participation. Uh, the whole project was noble, but if you look at some of the issues that have come up is that uh, there were no proper uh, provision for foot bridges, for instance. We, uh, in a length of about 50 kilometers, we only have about uh, 18 foot bridges, and this has caused uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, with that as it may, there have been attempts by the government to try and uh, uh, address some of these issues. And one of these, uh, some of these uh, attempts include formation of the National Transport and Safety Authority which is charged with the role of uh, addressing road safety challenges and harmonizing management of Kenya's road transport. We've also seen the creation of Nairobi Metropolitan Area Transport Authority to improve and manage the transport system. There's also been formation of the Transport and Urban Decongestion Committee, which was uh, put in place by the governor to come up with ideas on how to uh, decongest the city. We've also had an enactment of Nairobi City uh, County and Motorized Transport Policy which Kara played a, a leading role in putting together and was aimed at addressing the non motorized transport challenge for the city. Uh, let me talk briefly about uh, public and the quality of public engagement in uh, transportation planning, which uh, as it is, is quite poor. And uh, this is mainly attributed to the fragmentation in planning and policy institutions with lack of participatory framework. And uh, we also have uh, an approach which is, which is closed and uh, top down in terms of planning. Uh, and the role of public or stakeholders is largely ignored, despite uh, having elaborate uh, provision in the constitution about public participation. Uh, stakeholders are rarely involved in planning and design of transport or road projects. Uh, and uh, whenever that there's an attempt to do that, it's done just to meet the legal requirements, but not to genuinely get stakeholders' view. Uh, so generally there's a feeling that uh, uh, stakeholders are not adequately involved in the various stages of uh, uh, planning for road, for road projects or, or, or public transport projects and this has impacted neg negatively on the ultimate outcome of those kind of processes. So uh, we uh, have done uh, a bit of work uh, together with Jackie and at this point, I just uh, invite Jack to take us through some of the activities we've carried out together just to demonstrate uh, our work here in Nairobi. So, Jackie, please uh, welcome. Thanks, Henry. 
So one of the ways that we've tried to engage the public more and start a conversation really about the gap between current transportation planning and citizens' needs and priorities was through a telephone-based survey method, which is relatively cheap and quick. And this is now a reasonable technique to use in Nairobi because of the very high cell phone access in the city. A 2015 study showed, for example, that about 94% of residents in the city, adults, uh, have a mobile phone. And I guess we should probably note, though, that the cell phone and data use are spreading in Africa, although Kenya is actually ahead of many countries in terms of its level of access to cell phones in cities and also sort of the relatively low uh, costs of data. Still, uh, even in Nairobi, a, data, a danger does exist that the very poorest are not included in the phone survey, and this means the views of the extremely poor are not necessarily fully captured, so we'd have to do further research. So with support from the REF, uh, we engaged a marketing firm to conduct a low-cost phone survey looking at 401 car-owning households and a representative sample of Nairobi citizens, around 415 of them. And we asked, for example, uh, when decisions about transportation are made in Nairobi City County, do you think members of the public like you are consulted? And you can see whether you own a car or not um, in Nairobi, you believe that you are not consulted um, in transportation planning. You can see the numbers here on the screen, uh, and they're very, very high. Secondly, it was very interesting to see that Nairobians agree completely on some issues. Uh, here you can see that the survey shows that a vast majority of people believe in uh, flexible work and business hours. So what you'll find is uh, that uh, people in Nairobi leave uh, at around the same time in the morning to get to work and also uh, in the evening and you get peak congestion in these times. Um, there's also interestingly a great deal of support for lower speed limits in the city and unbelievably overwhelming support for lower speed limits around schools and this is interesting because issues of road safety are really important in Nairobi. It has very high crash rates and uh, this is an active political issue that these kinds of surveys can um, you know, provide interesting and important information for lobbying efforts to improve road safety. We also found, uh, exactly as Henry said, that the majority of people take matatus and walk every day. We found 71% of uh, our adult respondents uh, who are in households that don't own cars say that uh, they take the matatu every day and 42% say they walk. Uh, and what's kind of interesting there is that households that, own, that have cars also use matatus quite a bit and also walk. So again, this is a very transit dominant uh, city. Uh, and uh, one thing that was actually really interesting was that we had also asked the question, if there were special lanes for bicycles, would you consider riding a bicycle to move around Nairobi? And we found a substantial number uh, of the general population would consider it, about a third and even more private car owners <laughs> who are often stuck in congestion, even worse perhaps than people taking the tattoos who can get out or people who walk. Um, and they would be very interested in possibly trying this option. Currently, uh, there's not a lot of, um, a lot of building of uh, cycle lanes or, as Henry mentioned, non-motorized transport facilities, even though you can see from the survey that there is a potentially unmet demand. And this is a really good example of how these surveys can uh, bring up information that needs to be inserted into transportation planning. Um, so uh, I want to now talk about, well, I should just say overall then that I think, um, you know, with the spread of cell phones, this is uh, really 
an inexpensive and quick technique uh, that can be done by independent actors like universities and residence associations as an advocacy tool. So I think that's the big takeaway from this case study. Another really good example of leveraging cell phones and citizens is reflected in the Digital Matatus project, which involved a collaboration between my center, the University of Nairobi, the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT, and GroupShot, a small design firm. And this work was supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. It is a, it's an ongoing project. It's a, collab, it's a participatory collaborative mapping project that uses cell phones to collect and create high quality data of the Matatu routes and stops in Nairobi. This data did not exist uh, before we started this project. And what's really important is we put this data in a standardized format and created a uh, thanks particularly to the Civic Data Design Lab, a beautiful public transit map, the first of its kind for Nairobi, which shows all the different Matatu routes. And this data, by being in a standardized format, we could also uh, upload to Google Maps. And now if you go to Google Maps for Nairobi, you'll be able to see how to get uh, from point A to B using public transit. That did not exist before. Uh, Google has committed uh, to a longer partnership with Digital Matatus to keep the data fresh and useful for the citizens of Nairobi, which is really important because uh, this data uh, needs to be refreshed. The city changes, routes change. It's very fast-changing place and so you need to have a strategy for keeping this data really uh, current otherwise it's less useful. Now the fact that Google wants to continue to uh, collaborate with Digital Matatu suggests that since we launched this uh, in uh, 2015 I think, oh no I think it's been about a year um, 2016, um, that this is being used actually. Um, and so this is one way that the private sector can actually help us keep this kind of really valuable data for planning and also for citizens um, live and fresh. When you don't have transit authorities in many cities in Africa that are um, collecting this data. So um, and I, I think another thing that's really important uh, to mention is that the Digital Matatus project is very anchored at the University of Nairobi. And we have a uh, large number of tech students, computer science students, who are engaged in the project and also in the updating uh, of the data. And this helps create a whole group of uh, young people with technical capacity around mapping and using uh, and creating transit data that can support local government. So here you see a picture of my colleague at the University of Nairobi who's just handed uh, digital Matatu maps to the decision makers um, at, in uh, Nairobi uh, in 2014 uh, at a forum that CARA hosted. Uh, where we engage them uh, through the discussion of the data. So that's really, really important in terms of long-term sustainability of these efforts that eventually the government takes this over, but in the meantime, uh, we're creating the knowledge locally and also the technical skills, uh, encouraging local creativity around this, um, and continuing to engage the public sector. Uh, and other users of this data have been, uh, you know, the uh, folks who are planning the BRT of bus rapid transit for Nairobi. And also the data is being picked up to do new kinds of analysis. So, for example, our data was drawn off Google Maps by the World Bank to look at access to hospitals within a 30-minute Matatu ride. And you can see the hospitals are very centralized. Um, and it's much harder for people to get to them if they live on the outskirts, which might in part explain why many people like to live even in 
not optimal conditions in poor neighborhoods in the center of Nairobi because they can access facilities. Um, another study by Dr. Kaylee Campbell looked at access to health facilities, uh, including clinics and hospitals, and using the Matatu data and comparing it to what you can access by walking and taking the car, you can see uh, visually a kind of inequality uh, that exists in Nairobi. So the poorest of the poor can only walk. Again, you can see that uh, they can only access really uh, the central, uh, you know, not very much in the center of the city. You can see how much access to health facilities created by Matatu, which is some, sometimes called paratransit, and you can see that those people in cars who tend to be wealthier have much more access, physical access to health facilities. Of course, this doesn't uh, address the issue of affordability. Just a quick point that, uh, you know, we can do this kind of mapping for different modes. Here you see a partial crowdsourced map for bicycle lanes in Nairobi. We had a mapping party at the University of Nairobi and invited the many cycling advocates uh, in the city to help us uh, determine uh, which uh, where we actually have some form of bike lane and where there's shared bike lanes and where we might have other bike lanes. So the, we could start integrating bike into Matatu routes into also commuter rail to have a holistic picture of different public transit modes. We can also do this kind of crowdsourcing work with walking, uh, which would be another really important thing to do. Um, I want to just mention another really notable example of how citizens can provide data using cell phones and crowdsourcing that is helpful to both transit users and planners like the Digital Matatus Project and like the Telephone-Based Survey. And this is Mothri Route, which is a Kenyan tech company that operates on Twitter. It has around 500,000 users. And the people of Nairobi help each other out, uh, giving each other information about whether there's a car crash, whether there's road construction, uh, whether there's congestion, and it's a very valuable source of uh, information and community for people trying to navigate the streets, but also um, it provides really valuable data for planning. So here you see a Nairobi uh, crash map by Elizabeth Rezor working with Mathri route data of about eight months. She looked at all the different crashes that happened in Nairobi and verified them with police records. You can, I'll give the, you the website um, at some point, or you can Google Nairobi accident map and play with this. But one thing she found is that a lot of crashes occur near the uh, pedestrian footbridges, which are elevated. And this suggests that um, there's a problem with the design of these footbridges, that people don't like to use them or they're not well located. So it gives you an idea of how this can be really useful in planning. And so I will turn uh, this over now to Henry to talk a little bit about the main takeaways uh, and conclusions, and we can discuss more detail in the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie. As, we, as you've seen, uh, there's a bit of work that has uh, gone into what we've been doing in Nairobi. And we have some takeaways from our work, and one of them is clearly that uh, uh, leveraging cell phones and citizens uh, creatively can help engage policymakers and insert more data and citizen voice into transportation planning because we need a stronger citizen voice that can be able to influence a number of planning processes. We also have a number of stakeholders who are, uh, should be part and parcel of uh, a number of uh, planning processes. And uh, these are groups like the resident associations, which I represent. We also have universities, tech companies, and citizens who are currently in the periphery.
Well, well, Henry, we can only hear your music. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep, now you're okay. Oh, music again. Okay, okay. That's fine now? Okay, you're okay. Keep going. <laughs> we'll try again. Keep going. Yeah. Sorry about that. So the, the last uh, bit of it is that uh, we have a number of uh, very key stakeholders who are uh, currently not playing the uh, central role in terms of planning process, and these are the resident associations, universities, tech companies, and uh, other citizen groups. Uh, what we are taking away or what one of the things that uh, we can uh, strongly say from this process is that uh, they have an important role to play in helping the design, plan, implementation, and monitor uh, transport system. And so this should be taken into consideration uh, uh, when uh, planning a transportation project. Uh, lastly, uh, is that uh, we need a shift in paradigm. And by that, we mean that uh, we need uh, a more bottom-up approach uh, to planning as opposed to top-bottom. And uh, this will uh, essentially address some of the problems we are seeing now, where the roads are mainly uh, developed with uh, cars in mind as opposed to human beings. And uh, if you look at uh, the slide that we have over there, we want a situation where we have a road that is all inclusive in terms of the users. Uh, so that we have uh, the uh, non motorized transport users also being uh, taken into consideration in the planning processes. And uh, this will definitely uh, uh, address uh, the challenge we have right now, where we have to uh, have the NMT and uh, the cars fighting for road space because there are no adequate facilities for NMT users. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we want to stop at that, but if you need further information about uh, what we do and our work, we put our details there, the, the, the website, you can get more information in that particular area. And then uh, we have more readings, we, we provided information on where you can be able to get more readings. So, we'll stop at that, and uh, we'll be happy to engage uh, in the next uh, phase of it. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Henry and Jackie. So now we're going to move into our Q&A, where you can um, type your questions into the Q&A panel and your control panel on the right of your screen. So feel free to start entering those in. And we'll have a, a Q&A with Henry and Jackie for the next 25 minutes or so. <coughs> um, but I, I have my own question, actually, to start. Um, for maybe Henry first for you and then Jackie for you second. But have you, and I, I know you have the slide where you were handing the digital Matatu map to the transit um, authority uh, personnel and executives, but have you seen the transit authority now using the data to think through a new community engagement strategy or to plan new bike lanes or bus stops or street and sidewalk improvements. I know you mentioned the pedestrian footbridges were a big problem. Are you seeing this kind of new data being implemented or is it really in the beginning of the planning process? Henry, first, over to you. I think it's at the beginning of the planning process because what we did when we had uh, this information is that uh, we engaged all the key decision makers and we expect that moving forward, we should be able to see more and more uh, interest and usage of this particular information. Mm -hmm. So we definitely expect that uh, this should have a reflection on, uh, on on what we'll be seeing in terms of uh, use of data and the planning process. But perhaps Jackie could be able to uh, speak more to that. Yeah, we've seen the data get incorporated into some of the planning documents like the um, Nairobi Transport and Decongestion Committee <laughs> work. And that's in part because CARA has become a really important uh, stakeholder. The, and the city has started to, at least the last government, has started, had, had incorporated CARA into that committee. So then CARA also came with the, the data. And um, so it started to make itself, in, it, it, you know, it, it started to get inserted in more official processes. But I think I'll be quite honest and say that there has been some resistance to using the data uh, because there are high levels of informality uh, around, you know, deciding uh, routes and 
uh, and that uh, you know that the data starts to with, once you put the map out and you can start to ask questions and people can visualize their system they can start to say well isn't this a you know a reasonable route but maybe the government hasn't designated it uh, and so there's um, something that needs to be negotiated and discussed so I think that one of the things that the data and the visualizations do is start to raise these important questions. And I have to say, though, at least one conversation, at the, uh, or a couple conversations at the National Transport and Safety Authority, officials were starting to recognize that the Matatu sector uh, has a tremendous amount of knowledge, and many of the routes make a lot of sense, even if they weren't formally designated. Um, and then politically negotiating sort of that recognition is is sort of where we're at. Um, Kenya just had a new election and there's a new county government in Nairobi and so we'll see perhaps they'll be uh, using the data to address some of these issues. And was the transit and planning a, a topic in the new in the election? Sorry? Henry. Henry. Henry, was, was transit and transportation planning a topic that came up during the campaigns during the election? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, as CARA, we played a role in uh, just preparing or mobilizing citizens on uh, the issue of election, particularly holding the various leaders accountable or engaging them. And one of the issues that we were putting forth in our discussion was issues about uh, transportation planning. Because for us, it's a, it's a key issue and it's one of the main challenges that the city is facing. So this was uh, one of the key pillars that we uh, presented at the forum. We are calling them the, uh, the forums for governor candidate aspirants. And in each of the forums, the issue of transportation was clearly, clearly raised and we were able to get uh, very clear responses and commitments from the various uh, aspirants on what uh, uh, should be done in, in that this particular issue. So yes, it was part of the discussion. Great. Um, that also, also Alfonso Govella is asking, um, Henry, this is to you first, and then Jackie, who else were the initial stakeholders that got engaged in this process? Who, who, got, who did you work with beyond Cara and Jackie? You're asking who, who yeah. John? Yeah, who were the initial stakeholders that were engaged in, in this process? Was it, is it mostly just CARA or you just mentioned you were working with another organization, so are there other stakeholders involved in this conversation in Nairobi? Yes, yes, there were. We involved uh, stakeholders from the government side, the ministry and even the county government. We also had uh, uh, our, I mean, other stakeholders from the University of Nairobi. And uh, even from the civil society, a number of players, uh, critical players in the transport sector were involved in a, in a number of these processes. So it was uh, kind of what you could call uh, a multi-stakeholders engagement with a number of key players being involved. So it was beyond just the, the, the two players and uh, a number of people were on board. Great. Um, Jackie, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, UNEP has played a really important role with their Share the Road program, and they've been, uh, you know, a constant partner in terms of uh, the policy dialogue and supporting the NMT policy process. Um, that we're hoping that cycle mapping and um, some of these other innovative ideas around also mapping out the sidewalks <laughs> um, using uh, you know apps on cell phones um, and using crowdsourcing hopefully that will feed into that um, and also uh, ITDP has uh, an office now in Nairobi and they've been involved in all of this uh, not all these different projects necessarily but in the process um, and then there are very specific, uh, you know, uh, players in the different projects, and I think we've mentioned mentioned some of them. Great, um, Jackie. This question might be for you first. Um, Lasek and Catherine both have questions about applying what you guys have done in Nairobi to outside uh, cities outside Nairobi. Um, Lasek just came back from, after spending five weeks in Kenya. 
and said, while Nairobi was easy to move around, I wasn't able to find any good information about Matatus outside of Nairobi, especially between cities. This seems to be even more important to help the population of Kenya. Is there anything being done around that? Jackie, over to you. Yes. Yeah, so, um, hey, uh, we're looking for resources to continue to map <laughs> these different cities. <laughs> and also, I think it's a really good observation um, that we also need information um, for intercity travel as well. Um, so yes, we need we need to do more of this work, and this needs to be mainstreamed in the kind of transportation work we do in these cities. And in fact, a lot of times consultants try to collect data um, as they do transportation projects uh, in different cities, but that information is often not shared. They don't know how to use technology because they're trained as uh, transport planners, but they're not really techies, and they don't. You know, they're not, they haven't really learned how revolutionary this technology can be. Um, I just like to say I'm actually in Cape Town in South Africa, which has a, has a really fantastic emerging hub uh, with where is my transport, go metro, and, and taxi map uh, dot, uh, com. And, uh, you know, there's doing, they're doing a lot of mapping um, in South Africa, and the cities here are starting to engage a little bit more uh, with this. Um, and but we have seen this this kind of work spreading across the globe, and we're getting more and more uh, transit activists, techies, planners uh, working um, to get this kind of critical data for transit users and planners. Um, so it really is spreading, but there's a huge amount of work to be done. It's kind of amazing that the vast majority of cities in the world, do not have basic data about their transit systems, and that's totally, totally unacceptable, especially as new research comes out and shows. For example, a study done last year by Susan Shaheen at UC Berkeley that uh, users that have access to this data tend to wait less, um, and especially if we can get the real-time data, they save time and they take more efficient uh, routes to get to where they have to go and you know that's really valuable um, so we need to be doing more of this and it and it is spreading but it's not enough yet great uh, Henry anything to add on that yeah just to agree exactly that uh, this definitely does need to be replicated in other uh, other cities and other towns and we, we should be able if you're able to get more resources, you'll be able to see these uh, kind of ideas found in their places in other places because uh, the challenges that we are dealing with even for Nairobi are also uh, found in other places other than Nairobi. So it will be very, very important and uh, necessary for us to have these uh, uh, done in other areas as well. Great. So many questions here, trying to get through these um, Q&A, but thanks everyone for, for sending your questions in. And there was a question about recording the webinar from Elena. Yes, we are recording it. We will have the recording available. We'll send that out to you when it is available so you can share that with colleagues who weren't able to join the session today. So, um, and we, we post that on our website. We'll, we will send you the link to the archive recording and the PDF of the slides. Um, as well um, on the website. So a um, couple of questions. Uh, hi, Stefan here. Um, hi, Stefan. <laughs> He's from Where Is My Transport in Cape Town. He's asking, are there any metrics available on users' reach or analysis on the extent to which the data is reaching end commuters through the various third parties, e.g. Google, Mockery Root, et cetera, for example? Jackie, did you get that? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Stefan. I also want to recognize Stefan for the amazing work he did at Mathri Route. Um, you know, there is not enough data uh, about these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, there's some actors uh, who are very hesitant to make any of the data available, sometimes for privacy reasons um, and sometimes because the data is really valuable. Um, Google is perhaps the best known uh, character <laughs> uh, in this respect. But, uh, but, but so this is something that really um, 
needs more, uh, you know, more more research, uh, especially to really find, you know, how many people are using this kind of information and how does it impact them. I think that's, you know, the work done by um, the UC Berkeley team for the Department of Transportation in California is path-breaking in that regard. Uh, and I'm not aware of any study uh, in Africa, certainly, that's, that's doing this. And that's definitely um, on our agenda uh, to, to, to try to determine this. But of course, we have to um, start actually uh, creating more data in different cities um, and, and doing this kind of research in different contexts. So great question. Great. And we need to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we all need to do it together. Um, Catherine has a question here for you, Henry. Uh, Henry, can you explain a little bit more about CARA, um, what it does, and how, how it works? Uh, thank you for that question. CARA uh, is an umbrella body of what we call the resident associations, and these are basically communities within uh, a particular geographical neighborhood who have come together uh, to address issues about uh, service delivery that are relevant to their context. So what CARA does is that, uh, one, we facilitate formation of this kind of groupings because we are very keen on the issue about access to service delivery. And then number two, we look at uh, ways to build their capacity, either through training or providing the necessary information. And then the third one is that we create that linkage between them and the various service providers, in this case the government, and we ensure that uh, at uh, policy level, at uh, planning level, we have a very clear voice and representation of the resident association so that uh, we can be part of a uh, solution or part of the decision making on matters that uh, directly impact uh, on our members or directly impact on the resident association, so to speak. So in a nutshell, if you look at it from the point of uh, good governance practice, then CARA promote, promotes uh, stakeholders of public participation on a number of decision making processes. And we want to ensure that we hold uh, the government accountable we also want to make, ensure that uh, we uh, contribute effectively to the process of decision making and we have a clear representation on issues that are of importance to us. So that's what I can say, but of course uh, I can talk about CARA the whole day, uh, but <laughs> for purpose of discussion, that is in a nutshell what we do. And of course we partner with a number of uh, people. Uh, the government being one of them, uh, is, uh, universities, uh, even the private sector in some cases, just to ensure that at the end of the day, we are providing uh, value to the taxpayers and we are providing an environment or a mechanism through which the government and uh, the citizens can engage effectively on issues of service delivery. Great. And how are you funded, Henry? Uh, we have uh, members, and uh, being a membership organization, we get uh, subscriptions from members on, a, on an annual basis. So for you to the number of CARA, you have to subscribe. There's a fee that you have to pay as, as a number of CARA, which is subscription fee. And of course, we also have uh, partners that are project-based. Uh, in the, what I mean is that we have uh, programs that we run, there's a governance and uh, even uh, on areas about infrastructure. And uh, some of these programs, of course, they have resources that now enable us to make sure that they're successfully implemented. And uh, yeah, in one, in once in a while, we get uh, donations from well-wishers who appreciate the work we do and they just want to support uh, uh, what we do, the philanthropy, so to speak. But uh, basically, our funding is uh, from uh, the members and from the partners who we work with on uh, specific projects that are uh, within our areas of interest and mandate. Okay, great. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, Lee Randall, um, his, he says, hi, I'm doing research with minibus tax driver, taxi drivers in Johannesburg. Routes here are assigned to specific taxi operators and those which are perceived as more lucrative are so hotly contested that taxi owners, drivers, and commuters have been killed. Is violent conflict between operators an issue with Nairobi's Matatus? And if so, has this affected your project in any way? 
Henry, over to you about violence and conflict. Uh, can you just summarize? Is asking if uh, violence and conflict has, has affected Matatus? Yeah, if uh, in in Johannesburg the the taxi routes are assigned, and that's created a lot of conflict um, between taxi owners, drivers, and commuters. Is there any violent conflict in Nairobi around that issue? Uh, not uh, that I know of. I don't think there's been any conflict between the the taxi and uh, the, the other the public transport. We call them matatus. Uh, what we had recently was uh, an issue where we had a conflict between uh, the the Uber uh, taxi, so to speak, and the, and the ordinary taxi. But that was more of uh, business rivalry than anything else. But uh, just to uh, go straight to the answer is that uh, we did not have the, the, uh, those kind of cases, yeah. Okay. Jackie, anything to add there? Yeah, Henry, I might differ a little bit. I think historically there there has been violence, even uh, up in relatively recent time over some routes. I can think of the Eastley routes as one example. Uh, where if you start to ply those routes, even if you get a license, there can be, you know, um, there can be <laughs> some consequences for you. And I think this is not uncommon in very poorly regulated routes. So it suggests a failure of government regulation, uh, which can be challenging in systems that are privately owned with lots of different operators. But I, I agree, recently I think we've had, had less of that kind of violence. And I'd just like to say that I have spoken to operators here uh, in Cape Town, and many of them would like not to have that kind of violence. They'd like to have forums to be able to better negotiate and make sure they avoid that kind of violence because nobody wants it. Um, yeah, so that is, okay. a, that is a big issue. Great. <clears throat> Good, thank you. Um, this question is from Britt Harder. Hi, Britt. Um, Jackie, I'm going to direct this to you first. Um, are there any opportunities for public-private partnerships to deliver improved infrastructure based on this new information that you guys have collected? Uh, yeah, I do. I think uh, I do think there is, and I think we're starting to see partnerships between some really. Um, public-minded tech companies like Where Is My Transport and Go Metro uh, and cities, for example, here in South Africa. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, where these tech companies are building transportation apps and dashboards and allowing the city to be able to see their transportation system. Um, now, a lot of that's often uh, within a project context as opposed to saying look we need a new relationship between the city and the uh, you know the operators a more collegial collaborative one um, and we need to really provide this information as a service to people um, but I think that's coming I think we're seeing really exciting uh, tech companies who are actively building bridges uh, to cities and you know, I think there's also a really important role for the universities in this as kind of honest brokers um, to validate and support, um, you know, this kind of new network between tech companies, local tech companies and cities. Um, so I do think there is a role for the, for the private sector here. And we see it in the digital Matatu project. Um, Google has been a good partner in terms of you know, uh, supporting um, the sustaining of the data because it's in their interest and uh, to, you know, have Nairobi as a laboratory for this kind of data. And it seems like people are really using it. Um, and so for the time being in Nairobi, people will have this service uh, in part because of the support of the private sector and the university for mm -hmm. it. And then, and then I should point out that Digital Matatus uh, has all its data open and free and available for anyone and that creates an opportunity for many different tech companies uh, to use it and leverage it. So Nairobi, Nairobians have access to around six different routing apps uh, that use the data and they can choose whichever one works the best 
for them. Um, and so that's that's really important. Uh, and that's a, that's actually something Google also um, encourages because they use all this open data uh, and feed it into their into their system, their maps. Great. Sorry, I just sneezed. <laughs> I was okay. trying to mute myself. Thanks, great, Jackie. Thank you. Well, that's an exciting time, I think, in this space. So um, we need to do a webinar next year for an update on what those public-private partnerships look like and how those have emerged. Um, so uh, this a question from Melinda Hansen. Um, this one's for, I'm going to ask this to Henry first. Has the project had an impact on Matatu ridership? Has Matatu service expanded around the city because of these new, uh, the new route mapping of the route? Henry, for you first. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Okay. Uh, has the project had any impact on increasing Matatu ridership? Right? Has the rider have the rider numbers gone up at all because of the availability of the map? Uh, yes, I, I would say that uh, that uh, that it, it has a, it has had a positive impact uh, in that regard because it's now increasingly becoming easier to uh, understand uh, more about the route and how to move from point A to point B. So I wouldn't want to give a, a specific statistic to it, but uh, definitely there's been a, a positive uh, uh, reception and uh, a positive impact in, in that regard. Okay, great. Jackie, anything to add there? Have there been any measurements or surveys, or is it mostly anecdotal at this point? Yeah, we'd love to um, be able to, to have research, some research funds to be able to try to measure those kinds of impacts. Um, we did some surveys, and it was clear people often didn't know that there were Matatu routes um, to places that they wanted to go, and so uh, now that that's much more clearly visible, my guess is that people are using, um, you know, those matatus uh, to go to those places now. Um, so I, I would, you know, we need to rigorously evaluate this, but my guess is that ridership uh, does go up. Great. And there was another question which I skipped and then go back up. Have there been any um, considered using the cell phone uh, strategy to create any off-board fare payment technology for the city's bus system. That's to you, Jackie. Uh, yes. Uh, well, there has been um, the effort by uh, the Magic Bus people. I think they've changed the name now. Um, but uh, to use mobile payments uh, to be able to book uh, an intercity matatu, um, and that's an ongoing effort, and I think that makes a ton of sense. It saves people time because usually they'd have to go someplace to book a vehicle. It allows the uh, people, the uh, operators, to manage their fleets better. Um, so I think that's probably the most successful example, and we're hoping it's going to be success. It's in its early stages. Uh, other mobile payment, uh, other kinds of um, cashless payment systems haven't worked very well, um, and there's a, a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, often there's not as much incentive for the passengers or actually the drivers, uh, the people who up, you know run the system to actually use those uh, cashless payment uh, systems as they're typically designed. So there is a huge potential to be able to do that. I don't think we figured out exactly how to do that um, for in-city in, in travel yet. Great. So much to do. Um, yes. <laughs> then, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dennis Gakunga, hi Dennis, he is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the City of Chula Vista in California. Um, he's asking, is there a concerted effort to look at new developments and be more proactive in planning at the front end? Um, that's maybe Jackie first to you and then over to Henry. It's kind of a question from earlier, but this is a little more specific around real estate. 
Yeah, I think that's like really important. Trying to get ahead of um, you know how your city is is growing, um, and sometimes in directions that you don't want it to, uh, like you know towards low density sprawl, for example, that makes transit more difficult, um, especially you know more mass transit. So I think part of what we're trying to do, at least, is um, you know, we're saying, look, these cities, it's remarkable uh, that they have such high transit ridership. And so let's get the data and figure out how to make that transit really, really good. In part to say, you know, to people, it's not that you shouldn't own a car. <laughs> Certainly no American has a moral right to say that. But to say you as a citizen should have the option of using transit and good transit and many good transit options. Um, and that's the vision, and you should have good information so that you don't have to wait, and then you don't have the hassle, you know, of also parking a car because you can actually take a bus into town and it's efficient, for example. We want people uh, to have options, and in many ways what we're trying to do is say, let's get all this data and build this these information systems, leverage them so that we can build truly transit, you know, oriented cities where we have a majority of transit users. Um, so we are trying to get ahead and we are trying to leapfrog. That's the part of the big vision of all this work. And it's not easy. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it's an attempt. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Henry, um, one minute. Any other thing to add? Yeah. No, I just want to agree with Jackie because uh, at the end of the day, we want to uh, move towards uh, a transit-oriented city where we have uh, enough options. And there already a number of efforts uh, towards that end, and uh, just the, uh, the fact that we, even as Kara, we pushed for the uh, enactment of the non motor transport policy shows you that uh, we uh, really want to get a point where every road user has an opportunity uh, to make a choice on the type of uh, uh, the mode of transport they want to use. And that's not the case at the moment. Uh, but uh, we certainly uh, want to uh, get uh, to that direction and if possible in the shortest time uh, possible. Great. Thank you. Good. Well, we, we're going to have to wrap up with that. So a short survey will pop up when you close your browser, and we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, we take it into serious consideration. We've been doing these webinars every month for the last five years and always looking to improve them. We hope to see you at next month's webinar. We'll be posting soon about that. Um, also see you on our blog and our annual leadership summit in Cleveland in October. I hope you join us there. And more information on all our events and resources is available at meaningofminds.org. And I um, just want to thank our two presenters today, Henry and Jackie. Thank you so much for um, your time and your, your preparation for this and your work. You're doing great, great stuff. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. We'll see everyone at next month's webinar. Thanks again for attending. Bye, everyone.